Call to order the June 20, 2017 planning board meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the May 18 meeting and the June 6 workshop. Any? Okay. We will do them separately. So the minutes for the May 18 meeting. Any comments? Uh, no comments, just motion to approve the minutes. A motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Jim seconds. Any comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? <clears throat> All right. Minutes to the June 6 workshop. Any comments? Move they approve as written. Okay, a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Jonathan. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? I was okay. not present. Peter's abstaining. So, three items on the regular agenda. Henry and stay the first one. Uh, the 19 Wells Road Tower Overlay District Amendment, 27 Fout Road BB District Zoning Amendment, and the Agricultural Easement Amendments. And then uh, number five is public comment on items not on the agenda. For the first item on the agenda, I need someone to take over my chair because I will be recusing myself. I nominate uh, Peter Curry to, to be temporary chair. All right, I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? All right, it's all yours, Peter. Uh, the Town Council has referred to the Planning Board a request to establish a tower overlay district on the property located at 19 Wells Road, uh, the, and the Planning Board is holding a hearing under Section 1910.3 on amendments uh, to the zoning map. Uh, before the Town Council will vote on this, it must allow the Planning Board an opportunity to provide advice. Prior to making uh, the recommendation, the Planning Board must hold a public hearing, which this will be. The planning board may want to introduce a uh, zoning map change. We'll have a chance for the public to speak, and then the planning board will discuss the amendment. And then, at the end of the discussion, the planning board will vote uh, whether or not to rec recommend the zoning map amendment to the town council. Um, I guess I would ask the town planner to uh, introduce the um, zoning map change. I'd be happy to. I do want to let the planning board know that the parties who had asked for the zone change are here tonight and they'd like to make a presentation. Do you want to have them go ahead and step uh, Sure. Would it help if you gave an overview of what it is? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the, per the procedure for changing the zoning map is similar to changing the text of the zoning ordinance. And that would be for, before the council can consider it, they have to give the planning board an opportunity to provide advice. So what you have before you is a proposal to uh, add an overlay district. So it would sit on top of the base district, and it's immediately adjacent to an existing tower overlay district. The one proposed is at 19 Wells Road. There's another one that sits on Spurwick Ave. Um, you've heard this workshop last, last month. You scheduled a public hearing for tonight. Um, after the public hearing and after your discussion ends. If you're so moved, you can make a recommendation to send this to the council or to not, or to not recommend it to the council, or you can send it back to, the work, to a workshop for further discussion. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, would the applicants like a chance to make a presentation? Yes, sir, if you give your uh, name and organization, please. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Victor Manugian from McLean Middleton Professional Association, 900 Elm Street, um, Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, with me right now standing next to me is Paul Packin Peckins representing Crown Castle. Um, third row to your left is James Bonamy from Crown Castle as well. Immediately to his left is Stephanie Jordan, who's our wetland scientist. Um, and immediately to her left is um, Stephen Kennedy, 
our RF engineer. Um, again, I'm here on behalf of Global Signal Acquisitions 4 LLC, um, which is Crown Castle. Um, again, we started this process when we submitted our application for rezoning with the council on January 31st of this year for 19 uh, Wells Road. Um, tax assessor's map R05, lot 30-0, owned by the um, Jordan family. Um, as everybody knows, Crown Castle has its existing tower on this land, which is owned by the Strouts. Um, the current lease will be expiring in July of 2019. Uh, it's a 20-year lease, um, which commenced on June 1st of 1999. Um, Relationships with tower companies and landlords are kind of like marriages. Some work out, some don't. In this case, uh, this one worked out for 18 years, and then suddenly um, Crown Castle became like um, Felix Unger from The Odd Couple, as they've been asked to uh, leave and never return. Except unlike Felix, we have to take a tower with us, not just two suitcases. Um, the, I just want to recap where we are and where we're going. The board knows this, but for the public and, and people at home, um, as the chair pointed out and uh, the planner uh, uh, stated, this started with the council. They referred it to this board for recommendation one way or another. Um, this board will then send it back to the council. Uh, if it's affirmative, the council will then send it to the ordinance committee. Um, who ultimately will send it back to the council um, for a vote. Um, so we have a long way to go. That could be two months, three months, four months. Um, if that all happens and then the area is rezoned, we still have to come back to this uh, body for site plan review um, for the tower part itself. Um, after that, other carriers that are going on will come back separately. Um, for site plan uh, review. Um, our proposal uh, is for a minimal expansion of the tower overlay district and um, this that I've put on the board on the wall is the uh, tower overlay district as the planner said it ab abuts the existing um, tower overlay district and in the center of that uh, is a hundred by hundred compound where the tower will be um, and later any equipment uh, by other um, carriers. Um, the, the reason we're doing this is because of the breakdown with our current landlord. Um, um, we feel it's kind of discriminatory and it's a monopoly for the landowner so we want to move over onto the budding land um, so that the uh, Jordan farm can uh, benefit from uh, collecting some income for their farm. Um, we currently have antennas on our tower um, housed by the fire department and I've been in touch with uh, Chief Peter uh, Gleason who's here who's in support of this project and we've um, um, uh, affirmed that we will once again allow them to jump on the new tower at no cost to the town. Um, I've also been in touch with uh, Police Chief Neil Williams who's expressed uh, the same interest and he couldn't be here tonight, but he also um, supports the project. Um, what we're building is what's allowed by your ordinances. It's a 180 foot monopole. It's a smaller profile than the existing tower. Um, frankly, I, I do uh, this kind of work in three states and I have only seen one um, in the past three years for a lattice style tower. Um, the preference now is for the monopoles. Everybody's um, getting used to that style. Uh, it's sleeker and uh, not as uh, hurtful to the eye. Um, and um, briefly, we uh, submit that uh, this minimal change uh, will improve the aesthetics uh, versus the lattice style. Um, our proposal is consistent with the um, planning uh, as you've proposed as our land abuts the tower overlay district, so it'll be a minor expansion. It's not a separate isolated area somewhere else. And because of that, we feel it's consistent with your 2007 um, comprehensive plan. And um, uh, we feel that it helps support a local farm by providing um, income uh, to the farm. 
And the tower itself, aside from the rezoning request, uh, complies with the requirements of your ordinances under 196-13 with respect to property line setbacks, fall zones, maximum height, uh, etc. So this first one shows the tower uh, overlay district. The next slide here shows the um, 200 50 foot buffer for the RP1 zone. And if I can work this and hold it without playing, turning it on and off again. This is it right here. So um, this area here, which is in the RP1 zone, we will not touch. Um, it, uh, it, it does contain the tower fall zone area, but we will not be touching the ground at all. No shovel in the ground. Um, within that um, 251, 250-foot RP1 zone. Um, and then uh, we uh, uh, heard some concerns, valid concerns, about the RP1 zone last time and the our access road. So in the next slide, we, oops, too many. We rerouted it this way to stay out, hook outside, and then turn in from the west once we're outside the uh, uh, RP1 zone here. So we went over existing, the old existing road and then went onto an uh, area that's not within the RP1 zone. Um, and um, that's the gist of my presentation. I will turn it over to Paul who will do a quick follow-up. Uh, if you have any questions for me now or later, I'll be glad to take them. Uh, good evening, members of the board. My name is Paul Peckins. I'm with Crown Castle. Uh, a couple of the things that I want to touch on this evening, uh, three being why is this site important to the area, who is Crown Castle, and then also touching on the uh, photo simulations. And then I'll turn it over to Steve Kennedy, who's the RF engineer, who can address the, that kind of final concern that was raised related to RF and being able to move the site within kind of that prescribed area. So. With kicking it off, why is this site so important? If you look at it, it actually covers a pro an average of 80,000 vehicles per day. It also covers an approximate 1,000 households. So going back to some of the statistics that we talked about, 90% of the households have at least one mobile phone. 48% of the households rely exclusively on mobile phones. And again, this is what I think is one of the key ones is that 70% of all 911 calls originate from wireless devices. So kind of when you go back and re-engineer re that math and you look at approximately 1,000 houses within the coverage area, you can kind of do the math and look how that equates out to. Uh, next slide is, again, kind of why is this site so important? It ensures the quality infrastructure and maintain the integrity of the network. This site is critical to the network coverage of the residents of Cape Elizabeth public safety agencies and local businesses. This site is key for the fire department. Their radio equipment will be relocated at no cost to the town, nor the fire department, nor a disruption in service. As well as the police department has indicated their desire to co-locate on the new structure, and this too would be at no cost to the town or the police department. Our objective here is to provide a viable alternative site to ensure that there's no loss in service or a gap in network coverage. Uh, who is Crown? Crown was formed, founded in 1994. We're the nation's largest provider of wireless infrastructure. We're a leader in the industry and we work closely with the wireless carriers, communities, governments, property owners, all to provide access to the wireless infrastructure that we rely on every day. When you speak to one of the local team members, you also have access to more than just the person in front of you. You're, we are supported by resources at not only the regional, but also the national level. We have ongoing long-term relationships with the carriers through our national master contracts, as well as our long-term commitments. Y'all, I put this on a timer so that it keep me going and try to keep within the half-hour time frame. So uh, if these get ahead of me, at least you'll know why. All right, so how is Crown different than the other ones? Uh, we maintain consistency with communities and the carriers in our, in that, that's our number one priority. We maintain existing licenses with the wireless carriers and the continuity of tower ownership 
would allow our teams to oversee the entire transition from the old tower to the new one and minimize disruption in service. We've done this many times before and we have the expertise to do it again. We have compliance with state and federal regulations, be it the EPA, FCC, and FAA. We have our own in-house legal team that's solely dedicated to compliance issues and safety. We do annual ground inspections. We do climb inspections every three years per national standards, as well as we have an incident response and disaster recovery program. And what that means is that's a shared national resource that's able to respond with equipment, expertise, and experience to know exactly what to do, when to do, and how to do it in every situation. Uh, lastly, Crown, our National Operations Center, which we call our NOC, uh, monitors critical systems to ensure compliance with FAA and FCC regulations. It responds to network outages and other emergency situations using its network of field operation technicians deployed throughout the United States. It's open 24-7 with operators on duty around the clock, and every call is answered by an individual. And this is a critical point when it comes to emergency situations. Uh, now, getting into the photo simulations. So, uh, let's see. I'm going to kind of go around see if I can do this. Uh, photo one is from here. Uh, that is at Wells Road in Spearwink. Photo two is at Lighten Farm Road. Photo three is from the golf course. Photo four is from the wastewater treatment facility. Photo five, there we go, let's see, there we are. Photo five is from Spearwink and Bowery Beach Road. And then photo six is from the bend there in Sawyer Road. So, again, photo one, looking from Wells Road and Spurwink at the existing site. This is the way it looks now. That's the old infrastructure. Here's what it'll look like with the new infrastructure. That's the existing guide tower. That's the new proposed monopole. Uh, again, photo two. Photo two is taken from Light Road. You just can't see that site through that tree coverage. So there wasn't a need to kind of do a photo sim. That's going to be the same for photo three. Again, photo three is taken from the golf course. Same scenario. You just can't see that tower profile. Photo four. This is the old infrastructure. This is looking from the wastewater treatment plant. And you can see this is the way it looks now. This is the way it will look with the new tower. <coughs> Photo five, down at Spurwink and Bowery Beach Road. Again, this is the old. We've got the guide tower over here. Guide tower over here. And self-support there. New structure kind of moved over, 180 foot monopole, covered by the tree coverage there. Last one, uh, excuse me, from the photo sim perspective, uh, photo number six, again the old infrastructure, you can see it's just over the tree cover there, with the new infrastructure, kind of the same scenario, just over here to the left a little bit more. <laughs> this is what we're calling the transition period. This is what the site will look like during construction. So you have the existing, as well as the existing guide tower, the existing self-support, and as Victor talked about, that new monopole, that's more of a slim design, our profile. And finally, this is what it'll look like post-construction, new monopole is up, the existing self-support structure is taken down. So, at this point, I'll turn it over to Steve Kennedy, who is our engineer, and Steve will be able to run through those concerns that we raised earlier. My name is Steve Kennedy. I'm a radio frequency engineer uh, based out of Phoenix, uh, helping Crown out with basically searching design tower relocation specialist. Um, so my job is to come up with the design of whenever a tower has to be relocated to kind of create and give guidance to the real estate group to where the site would be best located moving forward. I can't give them an exact point because they have to bring back candidates, but I give them an area to start to go search. Uh, this is based on what existing coverage is going on from the existing site 
as well as the coverage from each operator. So there are three operators attached to this tower. Uh, one is Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T. And I have to take a look at what those site, that site does from each operator's point of view. They're all at different heights mounted along that tower. So I have to take that into account when I come up with the preliminary design. Uh, basically, the, the design usually, I think there was a question in the last meeting about the quarter mile. Depending on the height of the tower and what basically the service area is or what I can glean from what's going on from the site engineering, uh, it's usually a quarter mile or less depending on, like I said, the height. It can take into account terrain, uh, the type of uh, structures within the area, the amount of tree cover, foliage, things of that nature. So that's what's taken into account whenever a design comes into play. So this design was uh, created, and when I issued the original search ring, I basically say to try to say north, northwest of the existing area as much as possible because the terrain starts to fall off to the south uh, for the, from where the original area is. I run a propagation model using a standard path loss model, and it shows me basically just what you're looking at right here is a propagation tool that says I'm going to take and put a transmitter or a set of dipoles at a certain height running a certain frequency, and I'm going to propagate or see how that energy disperses over the surface area. Uh, this model takes into account, like I said, the terrain, the amount of uh, buildings, the amount of trees, foliage, things of that nature, water, all of those things come into play whenever this is done. And I said, stay to the north and northwest side because towards the south it starts to slope down. And any time the terrain starts to slope in a particular area, I try to say I need to maintain the standard of service that's there existing as best as possible so in order to do that, if you move to a different area, you have to increase the height of the tower, uh, hence the direction to, move to the north, northwest of the existing structure. So uh, that's basically the design guidelines that I use whenever I'm coming up with a search ring, and that's what I give to real estate to make sure that happens. Uh, are there, there was a question in the previous meeting. Yeah, okay, so I'll show you the original Verizon coverage. So this is what Verizon is doing on the tower and what it covers right now. If you can look at to the crosshatch, um, that's what the new candidate would look like. And you can look at the original red uh, is what the current candidate shows. So you can see that over on the, it's easiest to see farthest on the east side over the ocean where the red moves uh, out farther east than the crosshatch. So the movement of the structure has an impact on the amount of RF service within the area. And once again, the main, the main thing is to try to continue the existing coverage as much as possible because uh, if, it, if, it impact, if you impact the, if the RF coverage is impacted greatly because of a candidate moving uh, too large a distance or changing a very large amount of height, it impacts uh, where you have service losses or service areas where you have not too good a quality or your phone doesn't seem to download the app or Google Maps as fast as you would like it to. That impacts the service area. The next one is the AT&T coverage. Uh, you notice it in a light blue is the current coverage and then the hatch is the, the coverage that's going to be created by the new candidate that we're talking about this evening. And if you look at the T-Mobile coverage, same thing, just a slight move to the west. Uh, so that's what's current for T-Mobile versus what it's going to look like when it's relocated. So the impact is, is a, not as bad of a change. It's a pretty good change. It's going to be something that the operators in the area are going to be able to take into account their system designs. And then this is the uh, original candidate. I think uh, one person had asked to move and see what happens if you move the side a quarter mile to the north. Uh, so you see the change as the movement not only affects the eastern side of the site, but it also affects the southern side. It moves the site actually slightly closer in towards uh, the suburban areas of Portland. And then moving towards the east, uh, you'll see the movement of the coverage goes farther east out in the ocean and less more or less coverage towards Portland. And then now looking at the southern candidate, uh, moving a site south, uh, you can see that the, the coverage moves farther to the east and farther to the south. 
and starts to reduce the amount of coverage to the north of the site. And then the west side, uh, the farther west, it's about as close as you can get because you don't have that terrain slope to the south and southeast of the site, of the existing site. So moving up into the terrain area and keeping with, with about the same amount of terrain height above uh, mean sea level as the existing structure. That's the RF engineering side of, of what goes on within these sites. It's, it's, uh, it's a comparison of trying to make sure that the, the existing operators on the cell sites don't have a serious impact within their coverage or their designs. And when you're trying to juggle not just one carrier, let's say just Verizon, but I'm trying to juggle Verizon versus AT&T versus T-Mobile. And they all have different networks that are all different design different designs, different technologies, and different frequency bands in different ways, so I try to make sure that I match as closely as possible to the existing structure, the existing coverage. Yes, sir? Yeah, really the only one that applies is when you're moving it to the west. That's what you're looking to do, right? Yeah, the one that, the one that moves to the west is the best as far as looking at what uh, movement I can do. As you move north, it moves the site further in towards the coverage area towards Portland and begins to drop the coverage to the south because the terrain is just about the same, right? Yeah. There's not much movement. But as I move the site to the south, uh, you can see that it, it really starts to drop off and moves out to the east, more coverage on the ocean, less coverage on the land within the people. Um, but so it, the more north or the more west, north, northwest, the better. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, I'll still have to use that. How accurate is your simulation that? I mean, are we, the, the we model, deadly accurate or somewhat? Um, models have developed and gotten much better over time. Um, there's more data now. We actually, the model tuning or the models we run now within some of these systems are down to five meter granularity, <coughs> even down to one meter granularity. So for every five meters on the ground, there's one value for terrain or one value for clutter. And when I say clutter, I mean type of trees. Uh, is, it, is it water? Is it agricultural? Is it industrial? What type of, what type of uh, equipment or what type of anything is sitting within this, this one meter bin size? And it's very, very detailed and very, very specific. Uh, it's how... They're so specific that uh, carriers will spend a whole lot of money making sure these models are up to date, current, and as closely matching what goes on in the world as possible to the point of we'll take and do drive tests and validate, okay, a mobile is seeing, you know, drives a distance around a site, takes all these measurements against a GPS coordinate. We'll take that, bring that into the existing model and tune the model to make sure it really meets exactly what's going on in the real world. So when you ask how good are these models, they're very good. So, so the, the ground that it covers, obviously some of the equipment on the ground or other people's equipment has an effect on, on, on the distance that it covers and the quality of the, of the, res, of the uh, transmission, I assume. So yes. if it's a fairly large area, so how accurately can you can you um, datorize, if you like, that area against that? I mean, that would take a, a fair amount of uh, um, time, I would imagine. So the, the computing power is behind each one meter to five meter bin size, there's an evaluation. So you can imagine one meter. Right, right. And every time a, meter hap a square meter happens, there's a value placed for that RF signal within that meter. By the program or by, by, by reality? Program by the program and then by reality as well because we take real world data when an active transmitter is up and running and we'll drive around it and take a reading from it, readings, I think about uh, it's 20 lambda, so approximately 10 scans a second looking at that transmitter, taking a reading, taking that value, we take all those values, put them into a model and then update that model based on those reward values and tune that model in to make it better. Does that make sense? Well, it does if the tower is built, but if the tower isn't built, going around and reading something doesn't really give you much information. What we information. can do is we can take readings from the sites around that tower and build that same model relationship. 
All right. So that's how it works. Okay. Any Thank other you. Um, yes, questions before we turn to the public hearing? Jonathan and Victoria? I don't know if this is a question for you, but somebody, did anyone do a photo simulation from the Cross Hill neighborhood from Tiger Lily Lane? Or I think it's Peppergrass Road is the other, the little loop up there. Yeah, you can't, you can't see through it. There's too much stuff. Okay. You can't see through the tree cover. You just can't get from a visual representation. You just can't get there. Okay. But you did look into that? Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Victoria. <coughs> These maps are all new to me, so I'm just trying to understand them a little bit better. Yes, ma'am. Um, the ones where you were talking about the carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, um, the proposed and the existing are very close, almost on top of each other. And when you showed us the coverage when it's moved to the west, which is, I think, being proposed, if I'm understanding your maps correctly, yes, the west is what's being proposed. Um, why are some of these so close? And I'm t I don't understand how um, the West, where they're not as close, and these AT and T and Verizon are right on top of each other. Would would you have shown the West to be right on top of each other if you're trying to look at? If you look at the scale of the map, um, and I can't remember what scale this was done in. It depends on how far the scale of the map depends on gives you the distance between the sites. Um, if I run a GPS coordinate check, um, I can't remember exactly what the distance was. Yes. It was brought up during the workshop. Uh, how far can you move one of these sites? And from the real estate perspective, when I send my teams out, I give them a quarter mile search ring to go out and look at properties. We try to, as Steve mentioned, we try to find that piece of property that is as close to the existing as possible with the same elevation. One of the questions that came up in post meeting was, how does it look if we moved out to that quarter mile radius? What would that look like? So that's what these maps represent. If we okay. were to move the proposed tower out to a quarter mile on each point of the compass, that's what we would get to. But from the RF perspective that Steve and the carriers are looking at, what gives us that best coverage or that best location? And that's that's where we broke it down to the individual carriers. And that's that's the relo candidate that close to the existing site. So the relocation candidate is the actual. This is an actual and the other map is a just moving it out a quarter of a mile. Yes, ma'am. Yes. A, a hypothetical. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I understand. Sorry, I Thank you. Question. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, no, thank you very much. We may ask you to come back. We want to give the public a chance to be heard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> Alrighty. righty. Um, thank the applicants for the presentation, and we'll now open the uh, meeting for public comment. If you'd like to be heard, we ask you to come up and stand at the podium, give your name and address in the cape, or your affiliation if, if you're not a resident, and uh, we'd like to hear from you. Yes, sir. Excuse me, the, sort of the, the ground rule is uh, three minutes more or less per speaker. No if we don't have too many and you have more to say, we'll try to accommodate you, but that's the, that's the target. Bill Bamford, B-A-M-F-O-R-D. I live at 112 Sproink Avenue. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the Jordan's request uh, to uh, amend the ordinance so they can build a cell tower. Sometimes a single source of income that is not weather related can make a difference between survival and failure of a farm because we are aware of all the benefits that the farms in this town provide and of the inconsistent nature of weather which is critical to farming. I would ask the planning board to support the Jordan's request to amend the tower overlay district. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else uh, from the public like to be heard? Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Bill, Bill Jordan from Jordan's Farm, uh, 21 Wells Road, so we live on that property. <coughs> I drew the short straw, that's why I got to speak. That's what I would normally be doing. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize the point that we have, you know, that this, this is a 
rocky old hill and uh, it has certainly no use as far as crop production. Uh, we could grow trees there which we've already harvested and when we were presented with this opportunity for a continuous income from that little square of property, it, it just seemed like a good fit for us to help help the farm survive. It isn't going to pay all the bills, but it certainly will help in the in the months from November through March and April. So, and uh, so we're really really supporting this. It was it was not a short process for us to come to an agreement with with Crown to uh, to do this. We had a lot of discussions with them over a several year period, and we think it can work. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anybody else uh, like to be heard from the public? Okay, there being no other speakers, we'll close the public comment uh, portion of the meeting and open the topic for the planning board's discussion. Any, uh, Victoria? Well, I, I know we're here for a recommendation, and I'm not sure if some of my questions get into site plan review. So should I not get into anything around uh, the soil scientists we, who we have tonight or ask any questions that might actually slip into site plan review. So I just hold off on those? Yeah, a good question. I, I, the questions without a site plan to focus on is probably hard to handle, aside from the, the road thing, which I guess is kind of a universal aspect to it. Um, so Marie, you do you have any advice on that? I, I, I would, the only outstanding question that I can see that might be of interest to the planning board as part of the rezoning is whether the applicant has ascertained whether the wetland to the north of the site is an RP2 or an RP1, because that could have some impact that they may want to know before they finish their rezoning effort. Um, if it's an RP2, then that's pretty much all you need to know for now because all the other issues you can deal with as part of site plan review. Okay, then um, I was looking at um, uh, C-1A and it says a wetland note. The wetlands were flagged by um, TRC Solutions and I believe you said you have a soil scientist. So I, my question was, is that, do you work for them? I mean, can we hear from your soil scientist? Good evening, Stephanie Jordan. No relation to the Jordans here <laughs> the property as well. Um, I did visit the site. I went out to visit the RP1 wetland that surrounds the pond there on the site initially. Um, I also reviewed the wetlands that were to the north of it. Uh, but didn't come to the conclusion of whether it was an RP1 or RP2. I had seen on your zoning map that it was part of the RP2 right in here. Uh, so I just went along with identifying the boundary of that that was closest to the tower. And Maureen had asked Paul if I had made the determination if it was RP1 or 2, so I went back. And we sketched the extent of the wetland. Uh, it's a pretty large wetland. It does not connect to what is on the, on the map. Um, it actually matches up to the town's viewer. I don't know if you've seen that. They, you have a, a wetland on the viewer that is what I found to be out on the site. Um, it's about seven acres. Uh, it's inundated. There it is, you can see it just to the north and northwest of the town, the tower overlay district they're proposed. Um, Could you indicate with the pointer under the spot you're talking about? It's this guy right here. Okay. I gotta say, your map and my map aren't exactly the same. I'm also looking at C-1A, and I don't have all that detail on my map, so that could be why I have more questions than mm -hmm you would anticipate? That was the initial map I think that was filed a couple weeks ago and then I went out on June, when did I go out? That's probably where my questions are coming from. June. June 6th I think it was, it's not in my letter but so subsequently to that map um, 
Crown has prepared this map that you see on the wall. And that wetland to the north is what I had sketched at, during my second visit. Uh, the soils are, there's two soils that are underlying that wetland. There's the finger that you see coming down from the north and the northeast. That soil is uh, Walpole fine sandy loam soil. The other soil is a Hollis, part of the Hollis soil series. Hollis soil series are well drained soils and the Walpole soil is uh, poorly drained. It's a hydric soil, but it's not a very poorly drained. In order to be considered part of the RP1 district, the soils would have to be very poorly drained, as well as hydric, and the overall size criteria is well above the one or two acres in your regulations. Uh, so it does meet the size, but it doesn't meet the soil criteria to be included in the RP1 and have the buffer of the 250 foot district. Okay, and you have a, a formal report to that? I do. Okay. That's the kind of information we'd look, but that's where I'm afraid I'm slipping into site plan review, but that would be a concern. Okay, this would be the updated map, the most recent figure. Okay. You could provide that to you. So that, that's the kind of information you would include with your site plan approval? Okay. I just have one, which is a sort of a technical question, I guess. It's to do with the guide wire. I guess there are four guide wires on the. Uh, no, it's a monopole. Well, it's a, well, it's a monopole, but it's got to have. It. It's, there's no guide wires to it? No, sir, there would not be any guide wires on the monopole. There's no, there's no guide wires at all. It's freestanding completely? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Fair I'm surprised. That'd be correct. Okay, once again, trying not to slip into site plan review. Um, when I was going through the, uh, the different plats, um, it would say, I know you have to build on an existing road because of the setbacks, the 250-foot buffer. Yes, ma'am. And you are saying that you are, but then I would see proposed 15-foot way, proposed 20-foot way. What's the difference between what is existing and what is proposed, knowing that you are not allowed to build a new road, whether it's gravel or mm -hmm. is that into site plan review? Because I don't want to go there. I would suggest it is into site plan review, and I okay. would further say that as long as there is a road there, uh, the town has allowed total reconstruction within an RP1 buffer of an existing road. It can actually get wider, it can be more formal, it can be paved, all kinds of things, as long as there's an existing road there. Okay, thank you. That was trying not to get there, but I, these are concerns that I would have if we eventually come back. So. Yes, sir. Understood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And, uh, I had a question, which is maybe just another version of Victoria's, and that is trying to avoid site plan type of discussion. Uh, is, are you representing to us that this particular little overlay district, taking into account these characterizations of RP1 and RP2 wetlands, uh, is not incompatible with the development you propose without getting into detail. I would think if it was basically incompatible, there would be no point in trying to establish an overlay district here. Yes, sir. The, the buffers, as described, fall within the tower fall zone area. So in a sense, there would not be development permitted in there. So we're comfortable and we communicate that with the Jordans and they're comfortable as well. So what's left and, and really free of environmental concerns is the area where you propose to put the tower and you, you'll, you, you figure you can get access as you. If we, again, I gotta get a better or less shakier hand. So when we look at this shady area here, that's that overlap of the wetlands buffer as well as the tower fall zone. And we've clearly delineated that that will be a no development area. And then you have this area that is still within the overlay district, but within the tower fall zone, where in theory development could take place, specifically the tower, the accessory buildings, and the new access road that would come in. That's basically within that interior square. Yes, sir, that's correct. Other questions from the board? Uh, 
I don't have anything in writing from the code officer, but I have reviewed these plans with him, and there does not appear, based on the information we have in front of us, that there are any impediments to what they're proposing the zone was. I've got a motion for the board to consider. Uh, that would be great, unless anybody well, actually, has I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah, Victoria. Oh. Um, my comment as I was going through all of this would be, um, and to the board, is if the neighbor does not provide cell coverage from their tower, then it, this is a much needed replacement on a pole. And so for that reason, I would support this because of that reason. So certainly can give your motion. Yeah, just uh, to echo another point is that I would be supporting the recommendation to the town council. Um, I think this is a good use of uh, this piece of the Jordan Farm property. I know that it's on the other side of the pond. And um, one thing that's sort of interesting to me is that if you look at the map of Cross Hill, that it sort of appears as a paper road that extends Tiger Lily Lane uh, into this piece of property. So in a way, I'm more supportive of um, a tower up there than possibly Jordan's having to sell to survive to a possible developer to uh, put more houses in. Um, and also, given the fact that it's already buffering, uh, or would be, uh, excuse me, not buffering, abutting a, um, a, a tower overlay district already, uh, I'd be in support of the recommendation to the council. Okay, do we uh, have a motion for the board to consider? Any other comments? Hmm? Any other comments? Oh, I said, more comments? No. I, I think we're out. Okay. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the request by Global Signal Acquisitions Crown Castle to establish a tower overlay district located at 19 Wells Road as depicted on the attached map be recommended to the Town Council. Second. Okay, we have a motion that's been seconded. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Being none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Extensions? Carries unanimously. Terrific. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate your time and consideration. Let's see, Number two, 27 Fowler Road, BB District Zoning Amendments. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council has referred to the Planning Board a request by Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road from Residence A to Business B and to make text changes to the Business B Zoning District to permit a landscaping contractor. Section 19-10-3 amendments to Zoning Ordinance and Zoning BAP public hearing tonight. So I'll ask the town planner to give a quick overview of the project. Certainly. So as I stated with the last item, the typical process for uh, rezoning, and this is a proposed rezoning uh, change on the map, and it's changing the base zoning from RA, which is the map, the zoning for 50% of the town, to BB, which is the zoning, it's really it's the closest the town comes to an industrial business district, and that particular zone abuts two sides of the proposed lot at 27 Fowler Road. So this would be both a map change to change the base zoning, and then to go along with that, there are text changes because the BB zone currently doesn't really accommodate the landscape contracting use 
that the property owner is asking for. So at your workshop, you really didn't discuss the tax changes. Um, you decided that you really wanted to hear from the public first. So for that, for that reason, um, I'm not expecting that you're going to want to make a final determination tonight. My guess is that after you hear from the public, you may want to table this to a future workshop where you can um, go over the text changes, see if you're in line with them, if you want to make some adjustments to those. Um, I can go over those text changes if you want, but there was a fairly detailed letter sent to the abutters and the other neighbors in the area that asked them two specific questions. One, how do you feel about changing the map, putting this property in the BB zone? And then two, how do you feel about the draft text changes? And I think you've received one letter that is in response. So unless there are any other questions, I have nothing else I can add. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to open this for public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? I ask that you state your name, your address, and please uh, try to hold yourself to three minutes. Hi, <clears throat> Paul Seidman, 21 Oakview Drive. I, I just had a couple questions um, about the, uh, I don't even know if it's called spot zoning in this case, but where zoning is shifted for a single proposal, I guess would be the way I could frame it. And what are the implications uh, for what types, what range, what types of business could then open in that area? Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Uh, hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, my name is Mark Boyer. I'm at 333 Fowler Road. Um, so we are at the other end of Fowler Road. Um, you know, this came with a, a, a number of concerns for us, none of which are against a, a Kate business, because, you know, as, as a business person, I, I want to support all the Kate businesses we can. The concerns that are in the Fowler Road, and my concern with this project is kind of twofold. One is traffic driven. As of right now, with our current uh, businesses that are on Fowler Road, we're experiencing between 50 and 100 um, heavy trucks a day. Um, combined with the cut-through traffic that's coming through, one of the problems with the cut-through traffic on Fowler Road, for anyone that spends any time there, is unfortunately people don't adhere to the speed limit. Um, we've met with the police chief and, and rightfully he is, he is trying, but enforcement is a challenge based on our staffing of our officers and a number of other things. So, you know, what we're experiencing right now is heavy traffic at high rates of speed with a lot of families. Um, I have two children in the Cape School District. One's eight, one's one. Um, unfortunately, um, just two weeks ago, our cat got out of our house. It was out for the night. It was hit in front of our road. So my eight-year-old daughter lost her cat. Um, and there's concern, right? There's concern for our families. Um, you know, I, I know it's been a number of years ago, but there's already been a child killed on Fowler. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure that doesn't happen. And, you know, this is obviously going to be lighter duty trucks, right? Um, but still there's going to be that increased traffic. It's going to be traveling kind of all during the day, and, and I'm concerned about that. Beyond that, I'm also concerned um, where this stops. Does it then start to build into Fowler becoming as close as Kate knows to an industrial area? Right? Um, because now we've had one more property. And does it continue to creep up Fowler, which would be really an injustice to, to the homeowners that, that live upon there? Um, we have, we're at a beautiful end of Fowler. It's, there's all kinds of wildlife, all kinds of, of uh, communities, families, everything else. Um, so our concern is really traffic driven, what that means. You know, we already take a brunt of heavy trucks, and, and it's really safety for our children along the road. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Um, sorry, I forgot to make one point. I ask uh, permission to just quickly make that point. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering also if the whole matter of expanding, contracting areas, districts, um, would be 
uh, something that the comprehensive plan would be dealing with um, soon enough to sort of get some data or opinions from them. Thanks. Anybody else? Good evening. I, my name is Julie Sprague. I live at 7 Odyssey Lane, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, 04107. I've grown up here all my life. Went to Cape Elizabeth with Pond Cove Primary. And I recall driving across Fowler Road with my mother. And we used to call it Santa Claus Lane because the trees touched over the road. And we would imagine there are these nice, nice homes with Christmas decorations, and we would think that Santa Claus was going to come down this lane. I hate to think of this town changing its zoning to grow into the 21st century, because one of the charms and beauty of Case Elizabeth is its conservation of land. I live on the other side of Fowler Road, and my concern is that many families come down on the road to walk their babies in baby carriages, their dogs. Sometimes people are six abreast walking down the street. We have Mr. Murray's construction company up here. These heavy trucks come on the other side of Fowler Road, and it is very disconcerting if you're pushing a baby carriage, or leading a horse, or walking a dog. And I don't want the town to grow so fast that the development gets ahead of itself. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? If you wish to speak, please make your way to the podium. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to wait to be invited again. Make your way to the podium. Good afternoon, my name's Ed Kelly. I live at 339 Fowler Road, uh, quite near the home of the previous gentleman over there, down at the other end, the opposite end. Uh, I'm in favor of the rezoning effort to uh, allow the, the uh, Pearsons to have a uh, lands their, their existing landscape business located on their own property. I think it's a natural fit. You've got a, a Mary's uh, sand and gravel pit there. You've got farms there on the corner. You've got a farm across the street. What do they all have in common? Dirt, plants, jobs, everything, heavy trucks, everything that was needed to build every house in this town. I think a landscaping company has a lot to do with farming. They're bringing farming to your home on a small scale. I'm, I'm very much in favor of jobs, and I'm in favor of growth. I'm, I, I'm in favor of more homes being built in this town for affordable homes and for those who can very well afford them. Uh, I've, I've heard too long about you know, disrupting the rural character of this town. We, we have a rural character in, in this town. I've lived in this town for, I've been in this town since 1980, since 1993 on Fowler Road. I've seen the traffic. I've seen uh, their landscaping trucks go up and down the road. There may be some increase. They may not. They exist in this town. They do a lot of business in this town. I think it might help them to become more profitable in this town. Maybe hold their costs down. They plow my driveway every year, and I'm glad to have them do it at a reasonable price. Heavy trucks are needed. I don't see them using heavy trucks. I don't see them using anything more than pickup-sized trucks or those very small uh, dump trucks, maybe hauling a trailer. The big trucks do go rolling through. 
I don't track their speed. I go the speed limit myself. The buses go through. I think school buses go through. I think they're too big. I think with the smaller sizes of classes, we could go to smaller buses, more economical, less impact on the roads. I'll, I'll, I don't watch the buses unload at the school, but I doubt that very many of them are full when they get there. I may be wrong. But I'm in favor of this, and uh, I think it's a good idea. They've been good stewards of their land in this property and many other people's land in this property, in this town. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm declaring the public hearing closed. All right. Planning board members, what are your feelings? What do you want to do? Go ahead, Peter. <coughs> The, uh, excuse me, my, my tendency is to probably want to take this thing back into workshop. I would like to see us go and visit the site, uh, do a site walk just to get the feel of what the change from residential to basically commercial and industrial will do. Uh, you know, on, on one hand, I, I certainly appreciate the notion of helping local folks uh, run their businesses at the same time, this is clearly accommodation zoning, one parcel um, of land granted adjacent to a, a similar use, but nonetheless, uh, it's doing it for the benefit of one party, which normally is not the way the kind of zoning we have works. So I, I, I do have some reservations, but I can, I can see a case to be made to do it, but I think we need to have a chance to discuss it in workshop and visit the site before we take this thing further. Go ahead, John. Uh, one thing I was hoping Maureen could possibly address was brought up um, during public comment. Uh, can you just briefly, and I think we talked about this in workshop, but obviously the public wasn't there, um, or some of the public wasn't there, with regards to when these types of changes have been made in the past? Um, I, would, I would advise anybody Planning Board, Council, Ordinance Committee, whenever you're asked to do something like this, you should be looking a little bit higher level than just what the needs of that particular person is at that particular point in time. With that said, zoning changes are almost always initiated by a property owner. Um, you know, we, we, on occasion, for example, when the Town Center zoning was created in 1995, the Town Center Plan Committee reviewed the boundaries of the existing Business A District. They compared it to their list of permitted uses, and the Town Center District was different from what the BA District was before. So that was a comprehensive review. But you very rarely do those types of comprehensive reviews. Typically, it's a specific request. Um, the location, and I can give you the location where the sea salt market is was originally uh, added to the BA district in the late 1980s by the property owner. The site of the old Jonesies, which is now the new Cumberland Farms, part of that property was added to the Business A district. Uh, the Terra property on uh, Shore Road, right near the boundary with um, South Portland, was um, originally requested to be added to a business district. The property owners were strongly encouraged to dovetail their request with an effort that the town was undergoing to overhaul the VA district, which was a recommendation of the 20, 2007 comp plan. They did that. Um, it was a huge discussion. They did get their zone change in the end. So individual requests for zone changes really are not that unusual, but I think as, as Mr. Curry said, you should be looking not just at what the individual is asking for, but how does it fit in with the bigger picture for the town. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then a lot more. Right. Um, and w one other thing is that if any types of these changes were made, um, would they trigger site plan review? Um, or would it, it go to the co code enforcement? No, it, and it depends on how you write the zone, the text changes that we talked about. Um, so let's say that you uh, rezone this part, let's say the council rezones this property business B. Uh, they would not be able to add any uses to that district that would otherwise require site plan review. So the text change that is before you 
actually adds a new use called a landscape contractor, and the text change requires that that get site plan review. So if it's adopted as drafted, they still wouldn't be able to move their business back onto their property without coming to the planning board first, obtaining site plan review, and making all the improvements that would be required by that approval. And site plan review would also include a traffic study, something along those lines? If the planning board does, if that is definitely a submission requirement unless the planning board waives it, yes. All right, thanks. Carolyn, just one last comment too. Another reason to take it back to workshop, I, I do have some issues with the language of the draft proposal. I think they're, uh, I, I know it's modeled on the earthwork contractor uh, language, which I also find puzzling. And they seem to have two categories that don't quite fit together in all respects. So I think the language needs some study, even if we were to uh, consider this favorably. Anybody else have a comment? Victoria? Um, I, I said this already in our workshop, but once again, I think there were people that did not attend our workshop. So I'll just reiterate what my concerns were. And I, I am sort of focusing on uh, the higher need, and I'm calling it the justification, the demonstrated need for this change. And, and I just feel that the burden should be on the applicant to demonstrate that the applicant cannot reasonably locate his business in any other location, that it has to be 27 Farber Road. Because I also do support um, development within Cape Elizabeth, specifically commercial. Um, but this is not a commercial site they're asking. So my concern is that the reason we allow um, a home business, that's the first way you can start up a business, is that um, it's a, bus a professional use that's not as intense as a home occupation. And it's a good way to start up companies that are just getting off the ground. And I support um, those home businesses. But when a business desires to employ more than one person who's not a resident of the dwelling unit, and that's the definition, or the business grows beyond their garage or shed and they wish to store equipment and materials outdoors, then that business has outgrown its location. And these very successful business owners then go on to rent or build commercial buildings to accommodate their current and their future growth. And, um, and that, that's one of the questions I had about every time somebody wishes to um, remain within their property, but they've outgrown the home business definition. Um, they're just an example of a very successful owner that is now not having to rent or build commercial as others are. And uh, that is a concern about why we are rezoning this lot and not some of the other lots in town when other people have that same problem of being too successful. Um, so I was in the workshop leaning towards uh, only allowing this zoning changes, there was a demonstrated need that it had to be at 27 Fowler, that there's nowhere in this town center where they could put their business and still remain local and, um, and still grow beyond what is residential. And, and those were the concerns I had in the workshop, and I know um, I was the only one that came out specifically already with these concerns, and but I do appreciate the site walk. I think we do need to go back to a workshop, so those are some of my concerns and, and where I do stand as of tonight. Thank okay. you. Anybody else want to comment? I th sorry, I, I think it should go back to a workshop. Henry, I think it should go back to a workshop. There are a number of issues that ought to be discussed uh, and, and run over. One more time. Especially Back curve sorry. that too. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? Yeah, I have a motion. Go for it. Um, motion to table to workshop. Be it ordered that based on the map and material submitted and the facts presented, the request by Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road, U20-10, uh, from residence A to business B, and to make text changes to the business B zoning district to permit a landscaping contractor to be tabled to the August 1st, 2017 workshop. That's it. That's it. Do I have a second? Oh, we have three of them. Pick one. Peter gets the hand up first. All right. <laughs> I didn't see that. It did. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All right. It's unanimous. So. And Carol, um, I've got to go. Okay. Sorry. Yes, you're late. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. All right. Next item on the agenda. Agricultural easement amendment. Cape Elizabeth Planning Board will hold a public hearing on an amendment to section 19-7-2, open space zoning of the zoning ordinance to clarify the application of the state definition of farmland to an agricultural easement, section 19-10-3, amendments to the zoning ordinance public hearing. All right, yes, go for it. All right, um, so the proposed amendment is, the timing of the proposed amendment is both awkward and sensitive. Uh, the amendment has been brought forward by the planning board because there's been a question raised about an existing ordinance provision that talks about farmland as a priority for open space. And that provision references the state law, the farm and open space tax law, and that law includes a definition of farmland. The town referenced that definition not because properties have to be enrolled in that tax program, you don't have to be enrolled in the tax program, but because it was an available definition. Uh, the town had tried to uh, write its own farmland definition as part of the future open space preservation committee process. Um, it got stuck, to be frank, and um, did not write that definition. When this amendment was adopted, we grabbed the state definition and ran with it. Uh, that definition includes a requirement that farmland, that a farm be a minimum of five acres, that it generates at least $2,000 per annum in income, or some other requirements. Um, in, as staff to the FOSS committee, I never heard anyone suggest when there was a recommendation to preserve farmland that there should be a minimum size to it. Um, so this amendment requires that whenever an agricultural easement is proposed, the easement has to come from a farm that meets the farmland definition. But the easement itself can be of a lesser amount. It doesn't have to be five acres. It doesn't have to independently all by itself generate $2,000 per annum. And this is a very timely amendment because uh, the planning board is currently reviewing the Maxwell Woods project. It received preliminary approval last month. They're expected to come back to begin the final approval process at the end of the summer. And there has been information provided to the town that there's, um, there's some potentially a legal challenge that will be made that the town is not correctly interpreting this provision. So uh, if the town wants to try to keep its legal bills in check, regardless of how you feel about agricultural easements, it may be prudent to clarify how this definition is supposed to be applied. So the definition has been revised so it makes clear that we're still keeping this farmland definition, but it applies to, for example, the home parcel, not to the, the agricultural easement. Um, I think that's enough of a description. Okay. All right, I'm going to open this for public comment. Uh, again, if you come to the podium, please state your name, your address, and please uh, keep, try to keep your comments to three minutes. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Hello, <clears throat> my name is Becky Fernald. I'm 313 Mitchell Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I um, have sent you some correspondence regarding this. Um, this ordinance, the open space ordinance was developed um, in 2015 and approved by the town council in the fall of 2015. And I know um, it was after many, many months of um, community input surveys, um, town-wide committees, there was tremendous input into this ordinance. And I'm, um, you know, to make a change in this ordinance, I think would need similar type of a vetting process with many stakeholders because when you change an ordinance, obviously 
it affects the whole community. And um, this, uh, the open space issue we know is vitally important to the townspeople. And it's not to say ordinances can't be changed. I think there, you know, certainly, um, if there needs to change an ordinance, uh, it needs to be reviewed. But I think um, in this regard, that uh, any change in an ordinance, especially this one concerning open space, it is so vitally important to this community that um, there needs to be a very thoughtful, deliberative process um, so that people could fully understand it. Um, I know I, I've heard before that, that the Future Open Space Committee could not come up with a definitive definition of farmland. Um, this definition was landed on. It's in the ordinance. Um, it's pretty clear. So um, if uh, that's the ordinance, then I, you know, it needs to be followed at this time. Um, future discussions certainly can happen to look at revisions. And also, there's a wonderful opportunity with the Comprehensive Plan Committee meeting now to review the Comprehensive Plan, this type of discussion would be very prevalent in a comprehensive plan committee setting. So um, I just highly recommend that any change in an ordinance be thoroughly vetted and that it is not rushed through. Thank you. Hi, Paul Seidman uh, again. Uh, quick question. Um, where else in Cape uh, would this clarification uh, apply? Thanks. Anybody else wish to speak? I guess I come to do that. Sure State your right. name and address, please. Uh, William Jordan, uh, 21 Wells Road, uh, also a, a farmer. Uh, according to the Department of Agriculture, under several of their regulations, if you take $1,000 worth of income from a property, you can be considered a farm. And I think I know of people who have had two acres or even less and have done very successfully by specialty crops at the farmers markets. So I don't, I don't know if the five acres is an arbitrary number, but just because it's a smaller size doesn't mean it couldn't be considered valuable farmland. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and look to the planning board for comment. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, I, I understand the point that coming up with a particular size of acreage is difficult. On the other hand, abandoning any size means that there's no limit as far down as you go. And so there's a point where it's impractical to try and assess whether this is open plan. I mean, there has to be some limit to what size some, or small part is considered to be open space. I mean, you go down an acre, quarter of an acre, eighth of an acre. I mean, at what point do you stop? So, and I, so I'm, I'm not sure I can back any of the, any, any type of sizing limit, but I think there ought to be some sort of smaller limit to which it shouldn't go under. Well, I, from my perspective, any other, any other type of open space has no limit on it. Why should we put a limit on farmland? I mean, size, no, not limit size, but getting smaller. I mean, it right, has, same. There's no, there's no small size. Well, taking it either. to it, okay, this is playing at devil's advocate. I'm not trying You're good to, at that. Well, gee, thanks. <laughs> um, you mean... I grow some celery or something on a plot of land that's that size. Obviously, it's not very practical. Um, you'd have to throw that one out. So I double it. Well, it's a little bit better. And at well, what stage also, does it become also, viable? Henry, uh, this goes has to be accepted by the town. It just doesn't. Here, take it. Well, I understand yeah. that. Yes. So, so you know. Go ahead, Henry. It, 
I just want to make clear that we're not eliminating a size limit. We're saying that if a developer offers to the planning board an, open, uh, an agricultural easement, the land that the agricultural easement uh, covers must be part of a farm that's at least five acres in size. So there is a minimum size for a farm. There is a minimum requirement for the income. And what this does is it throws a tool in the toolbox if you're trying to preserve a farm that's five or ten or a hundred acres. That's a, probably, it's a very it's a viable you're point and I'm sure You're probably not going to yeah. use one tool. You're probably going to have to use a combination of tools. Well, that's and fair enough. One portion of the property could be preserved using an agricultural easement, and then other portions of the property could be preserved using other things. So I do understand your concern with the minimum size, and I think it's important to preserve the farmland definition so that the home parcel that the agricultural land comes from does have to be a minimum size and does have to actually function like a farm. Then in that case, I think it's a viable, viable thing. Anybody else? Jonathan. I mean, I view this in the context of where it's located in the ordinances is within the open space. Um, so in a way, I think we'd be increasing uh, the usage of this by eliminating the five acre uh, definition, uh, portion of the definition by allowing more open space because we heard it from um, Mr. Jordan today that if there are farms out there, viable farmland that can be used that are under that five acres. And so I'd hate to see a situation uh, where someone has to say no to uh, farmland that wants to be donated as open space because of that limitation on the five acres. So I'd be in support of uh, limiting that language that restricts it to that five acres. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, a couple of, yeah, a couple of points. The, uh, uh, the lady who spoke earlier was concerned that we were sort of in midstream changing the provisions of a, uh, the zoning ordinance with respect to this definition. Uh, I don't see it as really changing it from X to Y. I see it as being clarifying what we meant when we said X, uh, and that is the term farmland. So uh, that aspect doesn't uh, concern me. I, I also believe that it's intended, and we might even say so, that these various parcels th that the greater farm consists of don't have to be contiguous. So you could have a, a, a farm with, with a acreage here, here, and here. Some of it, less than five acres, would, could be put into this easement and, and qualify. And so I think the language could be tuned up a little bit on that. But lastly, and, and I guess I'll ask Maureen to help out the explanation in this, um, the issue of whether or not it is, quote, farmland is really important if you're looking for the density bonus by contributing agricultural land. Where you're not, uh, in the open space provisions themselves, we have four categories of open space. Uh, in priority, wetlands, agriculture, green belt, and scenic. Um, and I think Maureen and I may disagree with this a little bit because it doesn't say that you have to generate a score of uh, in the priority system of so much being wetlands or agriculture or whatever, you can have the entire open space component just be scenic uh, if the planning board finds that to be appropriate. So I am less concerned, I guess, about the agriculture farmland determination in the Maxwell Farm issue as long as we clarify this, that we're looking to the larger farm for the five acres. But I, we don't really have any specific guidance on how you score your open space in the priority section, do we? I mean, I'm reading the language here. It says, consistent with the standards set forth above, the land within the residential development to be preserved as open space shall be determined using the following priorities in the order that they appear. So I do believe that the planning board has authority when you're reviewing a development to um, direct the developer on which land is going to be preserved. And I think you need to do that direction in accordance with the ordinance. So for example, you can't tell them to put the development in the wetlands because our ordinance requires wetlands to be preserved. But I think the board does have that authority. Um, but to your point of 
um, how important is this as farmland, I, I would say that because the developer is not seeking the density bonus that is, he's eligible for because he's preserving farmland, you could probably be less rigorous in making sure that it is farmland. It's similar to the net residential acreage definition. When someone calculates the net residential acreage definition and they come up with 25 lots is their maximum and they're proposing 25 lots, we are very careful going through that net residential acreage calculation to make sure they nailed it down exactly. If they do the calculation and they come up with 25 and they're only proposing 20, well, even if they made some mistakes, there's an order of magnitude of five lots that will cover those mistakes. So I think it's the same idea, that, that if they were going for the bonus that is unique to the farmland, I think you would want to look at this harder. Honestly, I think if you looked at it harder, it would still qualify. Because if it, I didn't think it would qualify, I would, I would highlight that for you and say I have concerns. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, if, if, if somebody really feels so strong that it doesn't meet the agriculture definition, fine, it's greenbelt. I mean, to me, it's, it, it is a, it's open, it's protected against development, and it has some positive value for the town, which is what cluster zoning and open space requirements are all about. So the fact that it's going to be absolutely protected from any development, whether or not there's broccoli growing on it, I, it does not strike me is important as long as they're not looking for the density bonus. The other thing I should share with you is um, based on my understanding of what is important to the town, when someone is proposing open space for preservation, I am a very strong advocate for public access. Mm -hmm. And because this, this property is being proposed as agricultural, and because I am aware that there are some real limits for farmers in allowing the public to gamble through their fields, um, I think calling it an agricultural easement um, doesn't have the same immediacy to require that the public be able to walk on that particular property. If the applicant were to propose this to be just open space, as you said, then I have told the applicant that we need to find a way to get the public on it. Well, there are spaces in this development that are actually public walking trails, so there are. it's not, the but public I, is not uh, this, public good. But I had said that in addition to the places that are already proposed, right. that there would need to be uh, some kind of walking trail or something on this property as well. Because they're proposing it as an agricultural easement, and I know that there are limits for farmers in, for example, allowing dogs to run through their crops, um, I'm not recommending to the board that there be public access. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm agreeing with you that this farmland, as it's conceived in the ordinance, is what we've got here. We're just trying to get the language to eliminate confusion and doubt. Um, but to me, the, uh, this, this five acres and two thousand dollar thing is not—it's uh, not crucial to the town's purpose in, in these priorities. Go ahead, Victoria. Well, um, we have received a number of letters um, from the public, and uh, if anyone read the Cape Career, there's four letters, I believe, in the Cape Career addressed to the editor, but they're meant for the planning board or town council. So I wanted to just try to address some of the issues that are coming up that, um, that need some clarification. For example, there was a question about if you go onto the assessor's um, web page that and it would say that this land is vacant, or this land is farmland. And somebody said, well, if it's vacant, it's not farmland. And, and I just wanted to clarify that, that there are two ways to assess a parcel of land. And if you are described as vacant, all that means is that the land is undeveloped. There's no driveway, no septic, no improvements. And, um, and oftentimes those lots are assessed at a discounted rate. But once a building permit or improvements are made to that lot, then the discount's removed and the assessment would show that. So that's what a vacant lot means. Now, if your lot actually says farming or agriculture, that means your lot is actually enrolled in the state of Maine farmland classification program, which we are making references to. And there's financial benefit for that. 
And um, I do believe most of um, what we consider the farms in town are not assessed as farmland. Many of them are vacant. For example, I was going through the Cape Farm Alliance directory, and this will get at two points. This will get at the point of if it's vacant, that's not farmland, which I disagree with, and also to size. For example, the farm right here at 359 Ocean House, it is considered vacant. However, uh, a vacant at 1.49 acres, so less than an acre and a half, but it is a farm. Norm Jordan does farm that. Um, another example would be the Great Pond Farm on 200 Fowler. That is called residential, and that's, that is an acre and a half, yet it is the Great Pond Farm, and it is in the Cape Farm Alliance directory. Uh, Cranky Rooster Farm on Three Young Lane is residential. However, once again, if it's in the directory of a farm, and it's 3.31 acres. And another um, small farm would be the Down Home Farm on Two Harvest Lane at 2.66 acres, and this is also con considered residential. So we got a lot of information uh, from people saying, if you're not a farm on the town assessor's books, then you're not a farm, and that's not true. You can be vacant, you can be residential, you can be a farm, and you can be a farm even if you're just at 1.49 acres, and I'm sure it could even go smaller. That was just a cursory look into the directory. And, and we did receive correspondence, and, we, and then there, there's four letters that are in the courier, and I just have to say, in regarding to the letters of objection that we received towards recommending an ordinance change to the definition of agriculture, now, I agree that this is an important issue, but I'm a little disappointed that, at the thought that we're not working together to save agricultural land. And retaining farmland has been thoroughly reviewed and supported by FOSS, the Planning Board, and the Town Council. Um, so when I hear we need to slow this down, send it to the comp plan, um, let them look at it, I would say it has been thoroughly reviewed and there has been a united support by the public to preserve and protect agricultural land, especially when preserving open space as part of a new development. Um, if we don't support this as agriculture, uh, then it'll just become blank open space. It's not going to shut down the Maxwell Woods. It's not going to shrink it. They'll just use that 2.07, not as residential. They'll make it open space. So the development goes on. And further, the recommendation by at least two residents to sue the town exposes the rift between those citizens and the many others who wish to work in collaboration with private property owners. And by working in conjunction, the public benefits from the acquisition of, we're going to get open space on these development reviews we do, we expand our award-winning Greenbelt Trail when we look at these developments, um, and also we realize such goals as the permanent preservation of agricultural land. And all of these gains are made without spending any taxpayer money. So I am going to say I do support the recommendation to the Town Council to amend the zoning ordinance in order to clarify the existing provision that supports the preservation of agricultural land during a development review. Thank you. Go ahead. I just wanted to address um, one of, I'm sure you're all aware that I'm the staff person to the Comprehensive Plan Committee. Uh, I just want to make sure people realize the Comprehensive Plan Committee is not proposing to finish their work until the end of 2018. Um, there's a schedule where we're going to get to things. That we're not even going to get to farmland and agriculture as, as a chapter and a study until the spring of 2018. And there will not be any council uh, adoption of any plan until 2019. Uh, so this is, this is going to be a long process. And um, if people are asking to move ahead under our current ordinances, I don't think the town can really say, well, you know, let's just wait and, and see what we do. Um, people do have private property rights, and the current ordinances that we have have been adopted under a laborious public process. Um, and then there was one other question about if this ordinance is adopted, where would it apply? It would apply throughout the whole town, just as all ordinances apply throughout the whole town. So I just want to make sure that 
the public's questions that they asked during public hearings get addressed. Just ask one question in relation to that. Mm -hmm. Is the comprehensive planning committee planning on looking at the agricultural definition under the open space, the presidential? Under market? no no place is there are under there is no chapter of the comprehensive plan that has that detailed a list of things to look at. Okay. I mean, they're, right now, they, their goal is to try to get their work done within the time frame and to write a comprehensive plan that is consistent with the state comprehensive guidelines that have information that needs to be included in each chapter, uh, issues that need to be addressed, and that's, that's where they are right now. They're, there's nothing where they're digging down that deep. Okay. They might at some point. And so our, what we're doing tonight is just a recommendation to the town council. It's up to the town council to make any changes, but there's nothing that would stop the concept of comprehensive committee from looking at any changes if the town council made those changes, correct? Absolutely. They, when they get to the forestry and agriculture chapter in the spring summer of 2018, um, anything regarding agriculture in Cape Elizabeth is open for them to look at. So uh, just to comment on it, I, I, I would recommend um, that we send this to the, the board for, or to the town council for consideration. And if people uh, who are here tonight that had comments or people who wrote into the Cape Courier have comments, I would urge them to go to the town council uh, to voice any concerns or uh, comments that they have to them because they're the ultimate ones who are going to make this decision on if there is going to be a change. Right, I guess I'm the only one who hasn't commented. So, as many of you know, I am a farm owner, and I also am in favor of preserving open space whenever the opportunity arises. And I am very much in favor of moving this forward to the town council because I think I was also a member of the FOSP committee, and along with Maureen. My recollection is five acres was, it's the number that the state came up with whenever they passed this, this law, which I believe or was prior to farming intensity as it's changed today. Uh, it used to be you weren't considered much of a farm if you didn't have at least 50 to 100 acres. Now you are a farm and there are many viable ones in Cape Elizabeth that are less than two acres, less than three acres, much less than five acres. Uh, because of practices, we're able to grow more on um, smaller parcels. And that's a benefit to everybody. It gives us a lot more opportunity to have local produce and all year long. And to put an arbitrary number of five acres on something in order to preserve it, I think is, is wrong. It's a town that constantly supports open space preservation. And to fight preservation based on this arbitrary number that the state came up with back whenever they came up, they passed this legislation, I, I think is wrong. And so I am very much in favor of moving this forward to the town council and uh, Hopefully, they will move it forward. Carolyn, can I ask you one question about what you just said? I agree with you totally. But as I read this thing, if we use this language, the, the mothership farm still has to be five acres. The overall. You can, you can, uh, you know, you can segment off some for open space of less than five acres. So uh, I'm, can, I'm wondering if we should address your, your concern. We and, can address it now, or I can send my comments to the, the ordinance council. committee. You know, I was thinking about some language, as it now reads, so. I'll suggest the ordinance committee to change, but would that be the best place to take that up? Because I, I agree with you. I think the... Oh, this is going from, it goes from here to the town council to the ordinance committee right. and back to the town council. So. Can we pass this along, Maureen, with, with some thought for, you know, additional consideration? On, on Carolyn's just, point? Just, yeah, just to let you know what the process could be, be on this is if you make a recommendation on this tonight, it is my intent to get your recommendation submitted for the town council meeting scheduled for July 10th. 
Um, if the council decides to refer it to the ordinance committee, it could easily be on the ordinance committee's July 11th meeting. And I think it would be very reasonable for a representative of the planning board, typically the chair, but it could be delegated to someone else, to attend the ordinance committee meeting and provide additional comments. Um, you know, if you wanted to send this back to workshop, to wordsmith it some more, you could do that. But we do have some, we have a time sensitive yeah. issue here. I, I think, I mean, I think that could be handled at the ordinance committee level. But I, I fully support your point of view on that. I'm okay. fine with how it's written right now. Okay. Um, I would agree with Peter on um, um, the language that says the agricultural land to be preserved under this subsection shall be deemed to meet the requirements of farmland if it's part of a parcel or parcels that meet. I think that's where it, the concern is that it has to be part of a parcel or parcels that meet this five acre. And I think that is something that um, uh, somebody could present to or we could, if we can't come to a consensus on how to wordsmith that, we could just say um, in our on our, our motion something about that if there's a consensus here at this time about meeting that five acre. Go ahead. So I, I hear I hear you. I hear about the concern that about five acres being arbitrary. But when I was working with the town attorney to get this draft done, I was also thinking of comments that were made by Mr. Steinberg that, um, well, couldn't you make a flower pot um, agricultural? So trying to balance it, it seemed like preserving the overall intent of the current ordinance language and trying to deal with the immediate vagueness and clarify was more important. But certainly you were the planning board, and if you want to wordsmith this now or take more time with it or just send a recommendation onto the council that that's within your purview. And this would go to ordinance at council? So they if, the, if, if you if you refer it tonight I will have it I, it will meet that it will be submitted to meet the deadline for the July 10th meeting and the council would have the opportunity at the July 10th meeting to refer it to the ordinance committee uh, the Ordinance Committee is aware that this might be coming and has already said that they're willing to put it on their July 11th agenda as a tentative item in the event that it is referred on July 10th. So this could happen. Okay. I, I, I hate to wordsmith that on the fly. And if ordinance, if, if we send it to ordinance, um, I'm sure ordinance can hear from us at either a presentation, uh, there could be a council member sitting here right now that hears us, and I, I think concerns can be brought up if yeah. there are concerns. So it is certainly, we are sending a recommendation, um, and as we all know, the ordinance committee and the council don't always listen to our recommendations, but, um, so we have, I think we have an opportunity with them to, um, to put forward some more thoughtful ideas on how to wordsmith this, but uh, if worse comes to worse, this is this is better than what we have today. I agree. Can I make a motion? Then? You go right ahead. All right, then uh, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the materials and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the agricultural easement amendments to the town council for consideration. Do I have a second, Peter? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, it's unanimous. Yes, ma'am. I provided a draft cover memo from the planning board to the council. Are there any changes that the planning board would like to see to that? Or you could just direct the chair to um, make any changes she sees fit. No, I think it's fine. In fact, on page three, one of your paragraphs ends, at no time is there an intent to establish a minimum size for agricultural land preservation. So I think the letter is very good. Have a fine day. Anything else? Anyone want to speak on items not on the agenda? All right. Do I have a motion? Motion. Motion, motion to what? <laughs> 
to, to, to close the meeting. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn. adjourn. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor? All right. We're done. Yes. Okay, guys, before you head off.